Jesus. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Aaron to bring the message. Can we raise such a hand? I want to pray and ask Father that as you know as uh, you use the mouthpiece of uh, Brother Aaron this evening, I pray that you will know, seek forth your words you know, without fear and fear, you know, and your words will come forth strongly and mightily, O Father, and you will bring about you know, the result and the intention that you have desired. You know, using mightily, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Darren. Sorry, I need the air conditioning. It's, how many of you have felt hot this entire week? You all don't feel hot? Well, then it's just me. That's my issue then. But this whole week is very, very hot. So I want to encourage you. The is going through the first phase, which is the first heat wave. So please be careful because on Monday, as I was going to the bank to settle some church things, when all of a sudden, um, right in front of me, an uh, elderly lady fainted and it was due to the heat. So please keep yourself hydrated, keep yourself, you know, um, don't try to go outside too often and cover yourself well. And it's very dangerous now because at this time, at this heat, anything can happen. If you have air conditioning at home, please use it. You know, a little bit of electricity bill, you know, you know it's not going to hurt anybody. But in this case, I uh, just want to mention that it's Good Friday. You all don't seem very happy, you all seem very sad that today is Good Friday. <laughs> you all seem very sad, oh, it's Good Friday, that someone has died today. Yes, of course, alright? But, it is good, because otherwise we would have to die. So, don't you think that it's better we live? <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is, is this, that Christ came and then He took all of our sins, and then instead of us facing God's wrath and the curse of mankind, we now live today because of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now today we want to reflect on all God has done for us through His Son. Today, this Good Friday, the Lord has paved the way for your healing. The Lord has paved the way for our salvation. And He's paved the way for your freedom and our freedom. The answer relies within the cross. It's in the sacrifice, the beautiful sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's commit this time in prayer and just thank Jesus for all He has done. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Gracious Father, we thank You for sending Your Son Jesus to die. That Father God, even though we are deemed unlovable, but Lord, You send Your one and only Son. For John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. For whoever believes will not perish, but shall have everlasting life. We thank You, Jesus, for all You have done. Thank You for Your body and the blood that was shed for all humanity. We thank you, Jesus, and we cannot thank you enough but to commit this evening into your, into, for you, and all of this is for you, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks and praise, Lord, glory today, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 For this evening, you know, just turn to your neighbor right and left. We need to get up. Just turn to your neighbor right and left, behind and front and wherever. Just say that Jesus loves you. Now say it like you mean it. All right. Jesus loves you, right now. Jesus loves you, Kevin, Jesus and they can't, they don't, they're too shy to see other people. But it's fine, they praise the Lord. Now, I'm going, the one I say that is because, if technically, I, God, Jesus loves you, Brother Daniel. He put his hand up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Okay, Jesus loves you. 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 Okay, Jesus we're going to learn together. It's good to learn together. I'm not just learning, you also are learning as well. But to show you that Good Friday is the day in which Christians commemorate the crucifixion of Jesus, alright? It's a solemn and reflective day. A time to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. The events of Good Friday are recorded in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Now to shorten it up, what happened on Good Friday? Jesus was arrested, he was tried, condemned to the, to the cross, <coughs> He was mocked, beaten, and ultimately he was crucified alongside with two criminals, as what Brother Derek has mentioned. Now for Christians, Good Friday is a reminder of the incredible love that Jesus has for us. He willingly gave his life so that we might be saved from our sins and have eternal life. It's a day to reflect, church, on that depth of love and to give thanks for the gift of salvation. 
Now this evening I want to look at the crucifixion. Alright? Of course, because this is the day where Christ has died. And we want to look at the crucifixion. Now we all know the story, okay? We all know the story. How many of you have watched this movie before? Okay, it's a very old movie back in 2004. It was banned in Malaysia, but now you can actually watch it because it's online. Uh, how many of you know this movie called The Passion of the Christ? Directed by Mel Gibson. Okay, it's a very old movie. Alright, everybody knows. They're putting up their hand, okay? So, okay, I'm not the only one here. Now, this, uh, a lot of people will say that this movie is not as accurate. Well, of course, you can take out some parts uh, because they're not all there. But the main purpose of the Passion of the Christ film is about the crucifixion. And they've got many of that part right. And of course, there are other films like The Son of God. And then there's a TV series that's called The Chosen that's on Netflix and so forth. And so there are many depictions of the crucifixion. But compared to the movie, while the crucifixion was terribly gruesome, it wasn't very dramatic. Someone said, mm, all right. <laughs> I don't know if that's an agreement or that's a disagreement, but it's okay, I'll take that as some sort of event. But people, the reason why it wasn't dramatic because people who expected Jesus to prove he was the Messiah by coming down from the cross, and they were very disappointed. They were hoping to see some great miracle, as we know, that part that the leaders were saying to Jesus, you know, you're the son of man, you're the son of God, come down from the cross, save yourself. They were expecting a show. But instead, Jesus stayed on the cross. And he died even sooner than most of the victims that were on the cross before. But there was actually some sort of drama, you know. If you read properly as what Brother Darren Park, he actually stole my verse. I pray, praise God that he actually stole my verse. So it gives you a bit of, you know, an idea of how he looks. There was some drama at the crucifixion. There are four unique events, okay? There are four unique dramatic events that took place. Sorry, I'm going to skip some parts. Okay. There's four unique dramatic events that took place, and they are here to help us understand Jesus' death. Now, we're going to look at the book of Matthew, okay? Matthew recorded all four of these events, okay? Now, I want you all to turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Don't go to any verse yet, just go to the chapter first. I'll later explain to you why Matthew is... The one I chose, okay? Now, Matthew wrote his gospel was to prove to the Jewish countrymen that Jesus was the Messiah. And these dramatic events were part of his proof. It is important to note that the gospel writer, Matthew, does not explain the meaning of these events. He simply records them. Now, a lot of people say, why he doesn't explain? Why is it such a big deal? Why can't he just explain simply? Well, to know this because the events speak for themselves as a divine approval of the sacrifice of Jesus. We'll go more later on. But yet, a careful look at these four events will tell us there is more than meets the eye. Now, as I said, all four accounts are recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we're going to go to Matthew, alright? We're going to laser focus on Matthew here, alright? You should read everything, but we're going to pinpoint a few things here. Just go to verse 45. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 first. Just 45. Now, in verse 45, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. Okay, we stop there. Now we skip a few verses in front. 51 to 53. Okay. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Alright. That verse itself will already give you a highlight on these four events that took place. Now as I said, Matthew, when he wrote this, was written primarily for the Jewish audience. But it's worth the time to unpack these events because once you wrestle with them, You'll never experience Easter the same way. Yes, Easter, okay? There's always a part two. Part one, Jesus gave his life, but the part two is coming. And guess what? There's a part three, where he returns. Now, when we come to that, let's go to number one. Darkness covered the entire land. Now, Mark reports, sorry, Brother Chan, if you would be so kindly to push the button, because knowing me, I'll just talk and I won't even focus on the slides. But Mark reports, if you read the book of Mark, he reports after the torture and the humiliation of Jesus at the hands of the Romans. 
and their Jewish accomplices. Now Jesus was placed on the cross at 9 a.m. But something extraordinary happened here that, not, that no event has ever happened before. As we read in verse 45, there was darkness over the land. This is such a very powerful event. Now a lot of people will complain and say that this is actually a solar eclipse. It's some sort of eclipse of the moon, that, that's why it became dark. But let me be very clear that it happened for a very long time and usually eclipse usually happen the duration is about 8 minutes. What did it say? From the 6th hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the whole land. That's a pretty long time for darkness, for an eclipse especially. So technically it's not an eclipse. But moving forward, it's definitely not an eclipse. So we're just going to say there was darkness. But let's consider the very important facts here. It happened on the time, at the exact moment, that the Son of God was being crucified. How can anyone explain such a coincidence? Have you ever seen anything happen when someone passes away? Any traumatic thing happen? Darkness, thunder, earthquakes. This is the only event that took place at a very specific time, a very specific day, and a very specific hour for a very specific person. What's the significance of this event? What's so special about darkness coming over the whole land? What does it mean? All these actually have meaning. And God doesn't just do it just blindly and just simply. He always gives something. And that is in the book of the Old Testament. In Amos chapter 5 verse 18, it says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. The day of the Lord represents judgment. Represents the judgment of the wicked. You want to take an example in the Old Testament? It happened in Egypt. You all know the story of Exodus. In the ninth plague, darkness came over the land for a period of three days. If you need a reference for this, as in Exodus chapter 10, verse 21 to 22. It said, The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may be felt. Not just only, not just only darkness, but you can actually feel the wrath of God. So Moses stretched out his hand towards heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. What happened next? Then you go to the tenth plague. Darkness came the death of the firstborn sons. Darkness preceded death. Likewise on the cross, darkness preceded death of God's Son, Jesus. But church, for us, this death is a prerequisite death. It's a prerequisite for eternal victory. You see, on the cross, our sins were placed vicariously on the sinless Jesus and God poured out His judgment on Christ instead of us. That's why it's called Good Friday. If you want to endure the wrath of God, then we should take over in Jesus' place. But it's good because God actually poured out His entire judgment upon Jesus because Jesus took all the sins of mankind. And this is something we have to get it right. A lot of people think Good Friday should be a sad moment, but actually it's good because Christ took your place when we were supposed to take the cross. We were supposed to die. Instead of us, Christ took it for us. Jesus endured God's judgment. He took our sins so that we might be free. Are we free, church? Or are we still under the curse? Are we still in bondage? Are we still in chains? Are we not free, church? Then you know this is a very significant moment, a very specific and significant event that took place here. Let's go to number two now. The massive curtain of the temple was torn in half. This took place at the same time when Jesus' death is reported in chapter 27, verse 51 in Matthew. 
The temple, the uh, veil of the temple was torn in half from top to bottom. Some translations will say it was torn in two. This refers to the inner curtain, okay? Between the holy place and the most holy place. That's a figure, if I'm not mistaken, in the slides that depicts what the temple would look like if you can just go forward. One more time. One more. One more. You're almost there. One more time. Okay, there we go. Good job. Rajan is doing a great job. Now, here you'll see that there is two places where you are allowed to enter. And the only place you cannot enter is the most holy place. But let me tell you something. This is not just any curtain, okay? This is not just some fancy curtain we hang in our home and then we close the blinds every time and there's some, some sunlight. This curtain separated the most holy section of the temple where only the high priest could enter once a year. That single entry by the priest was to make sacrifice for atonement of sin on behalf of the people. This is actually very serious. Any unauthorized entry into the area resulted in instant death. So the section was demarcated with a huge curtain. To know more about this curtain, what's so special about this curtain? Is it anything important to the temple? It was the height of six-story buildings. And as wide as three-story buildings. So it's not some, some normal curtain, it was quite tall. It was elaborately and thickly wo woven with 72 plants of 24 threads each. Meaning that this was a material that's not easily torn. Let alone cut as well. It's not something you can just tear with your bare hands. Even if you were to cut it, it is so thick to a point that it's not going to be easy. Thus, the curtain to be split in half was something remarkable enough. And Matthew specifies it happened, the tearing happened from top to bottom. This could only have been done by the power of God. And again, this happening at this moment where Jesus died on the cross should have made clear to the Jewish religious leaders that they indeed have killed the Son of God. But again, as I brought to the first question, what's so significant about this? What's so important about this curtain? Does it specify any certain meaning? Does it symbolize anything? It does specify something, church. It symbolizes the opening of the door of salvation. It eliminates the barrier of sin and sacrifice of animals. It removes special privileges of priests to intercede on our behalf before God for the forgiveness of sin. Rather, church, we are now free and begotten through Christ as the children of God. It shows how Jesus' death on the cross made it possible for anyone to come to God through faith in Jesus. Those who come through Jesus can come boldly without fear, right into the presence of the Almighty God. What I'm trying to say is, church here, is the need for the Jewish sacrificial system that God had given to Israel was no longer needed. The perfect and final sacrifice for sin is Jesus himself. Has been made. In both spiritual and literal sense, church, the barrier between man and God has been removed by God Himself. Sometimes in our lives, we may put up some curtains too, spiritual ones especially. We may think that only a specific person can intercede for us. It's not wrong to pray for other people. I mean, the Bible specific, specifies that we ought to pray for other people and intercede for other people. That's correct. But sometimes, we are so fearful of God to a point where we have to perform certain things to make ourselves pure before Him. You know, there's a song that, you know, I think last week we sang, um, nothing you can do can make Him love you more, and nothing that you've done can make Him close the door. Because of His great love, He gave His only Son, everything was done so you could come. That song is... Just basically a summary of this part here. That no matter what traditions we do, we can sing in worship, 
we can play an instrument, we can speak very boldly here, but nothing matters more than you coming back to, to God. Remove that curtain that's blocking you. Remove that curtain that's hindering you from going to God. Some of us, we put it up in front of us and we think that we're not pure, we're not holy enough to go to God. The Bible specifies we're not, we're, we're sinful people, but we are made pure through Christ. And Christ is the way to the Father. The third one, the third event, a lot of people will debate on this, is an earthquake shook the world. Now earthquakes are quite common, okay, especially in the Middle East. I think recently in this month of March, March 24th, there was an earthquake that happened in the Middle East. And there are plenty of instances where earthquakes usually are recorded in the Bible and other historical places and accounts. But however, this earthquake happened and took place is because of its timing. It happened in conjunction with the other two events at the precise time when Jesus, the Son of God, was being crucified. This tells us that this is a super supernatural event. Yes, super super, I said it twice. Because normally when supernatural things happen, it only happens once. This is more than one thing happening at the same time. Already we are we have gone through the darkness and now uh, the rib curtain. Now we're going through the earthquake section now. It's a super supernatural. There's multiple things happening here at the same time. But once again, the same question as I asked for the other two. Does this have any significance? What does this earthquake even represent? Does it, does it really have a meaning on Good Friday? Does it really specify anything? Everything God does, He does it with a meaning. He doesn't do it blindly. He doesn't leave things for us to question and for us to, to have no answer. He always gives an answer. If you read more in the Old Testament, usually earthquakes in the Bible often accompany divine revelation or a unique act of God. Example, when God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai to give His law, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, what does it say there? The whole mountain shook violently. We can connect the earthquake at Mount Sinai to the earthquake at Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. The earthquake at Calvary signifies that the demands of the law delivered at Mount Sinai has been fulfilled through the death of Christ. Remember the three words that Christ said on the cross? It is finished. It wasn't just to say that He has done His part. Remember Christ did not come to abolish or destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. And all the prophets and and the law from the Old Testament was leading up towards this glorious, wonderful day where Jesus is being crucified, has been fulfilled. The perfect sacrifice has been done. We are no longer bound by the law, church, but we are redeemed by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know more about the Old Testament, if you read between the lines, the Old Testament contains more than 300 prophecies of Jesus. This highlights Jesus' central role in the Old Testament. Christ is the main figure in the Old Testament. There's one part in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And the beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Everything from the beginning of time up until the crucifixion, it was all to pave the way for Christ to die. Everything was for Christ. Everything was about Him and all was for Him. You know, when we look at these events, we just think it's just a bunch of events. There's an earthquake, there's darkness, there's veil, there's torn. But nobody really understands the meaning of it. I remember watching the Passion of the Christ. And there's always that part, after Jesus said, it is finished, that part where the scene where earthquake shook, the, the, the temple shook, and then the veil was torn, it all didn't, it all just made, didn't make sense for me when I was a kid. 
I didn't understand. What was all of this have meaning? Does it even have a meaning? What has this all got to do with Jesus? But when you read between the lines from the Old Testament and you compare it to what happened at Calvary, it was all for Jesus. Everything was done so He could come. Number four, the dead were instantly raised. There are some parts in the in book of Luke and book of John, and sometimes in Mark, they don't really specify this part. But Mark expounded this. It's probably the most profound and the most debated of the events that happened at the death of Jesus on the cross. In Matthew 27, verse 52 to 53, it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So what's going on here? What's happening here? It's something strange that's taking place. But there's nothing to expound here because it's pretty clear. It's plain and simple. It's written here in black and white. There was an earthquake and rocks, and the rocks were split. What happened here is this disrupted the tombs of the bodies of saints who were free from the shackles of death. Now we do not know who these saints are. Honestly, we didn't tell who these saints are, but we can infer, infer only, they would be God-honoring people from Israel and other places, including prophets and other people of God. Now what's even more fascinating in verse 53 here, it says, and coming out of the grave after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is beyond anything explicable through the physical loss. What I'm trying to say, church, here is these uncovered bodies were seen alive in the city of Jerusalem after Jesus rose from the dead. Something very, very strange is taking place here. And something that we ought to pay attention to. Because this is not just only for the ones in the past, but it's also for us. Before we unpack all this church, we have to briefly touch on one specific event that happened in the Old Testament. One special prophet in Israel's history. His name is Ezekiel. Prophet Ezekiel, as you can say. Now, Ezekiel lived about 600 years before Jesus. At the time, Israel was, it was particularly low at its point in history. Their homeland was destroyed. The temple was burned. And the people were taken away as political exile to Babylon. Most people who knew or know of Ezekiel associated him with one specific vision, one specific event, which was the vision of the dry bones. Some of you may know this, the vision of the dry bones, some of you may not know, it's okay, we'll expound it, as I said, we're here to learn together. You see, the whole thing is recounted in the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm going to highlight some of this part here. Now, Ezekiel is transported to a valley. Now, keep in mind this is a vision, okay? It's full of dry bones. God breathes on the bones, and what happens is there's some shaking that's happening. The bones came together. What happens next is tendons grew on them. Then muscles. And by the end of it, what was dead and dry is now a living, breathing army. What is God doing here? What God's doing here is more than we think, church. It's a symbol of His plan. And what ultimately is achieved through the death of Christ. You know, all that stuff that happened after Jesus died can be related directly back to this 600-year-old prophet's vision. You see, the resurrection of the saints, what it specifies, it demonstrates Jesus' victory over death. It represents what will come at the end of time in the final resurrection. 
when Christ comes back in glory. This is exactly what Apostle Paul says when he was talking about in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Here is the last sentence here. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Thus, church, the risen saint symbolizes the hope and expectation of eternal life. Eternal life it went in paradise. That all believers have because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. All of history from the Old Testament was leading up to this Good Friday. As shown in the Old Testament prophecies, everything was accomplished on Good Friday. The things in the past have been done. It is accomplished. It is finished. This is the good news, church, about Good Friday. And we can definitely share this with everyone around us. This is not just something for us. This is for everyone to come to know Jesus and to receive Him. Good Friday is good because Christ died and took our place. But what's even better and what's even more good is that we can even share it with other people. Let us not be afraid to do this. We know people, we have people in mind that we would like to share this good news on Good Friday to everyone around us. But do it discreetly, church, because it may be too late when the time comes. And when it's too late, there is no second chances anymore. It is now or never. This good news is not just only for us. It's for your family, your friends, for anyone. And that's the thing here, church. Jesus completed the work to not only save us from our sin, but to also bring us back into fellowship with our Creator through Jesus' sacrifice. As we look forward to Easter, which will be in a couple of days' time, we must remember Good Friday as the day that opened the door, the way for our friendship with God to be restored. This is the good news about Good Friday Church. And we can share it with everyone around us. Take this back with you tonight. This is not just something for you to keep and then store it up, but let it shine through every day in your life. After this, I would just like to sing back that song. Um, I forgot what song it was. I think it was Worthy Is Your Name. Yeah, I would like to sing back that song, Worthy Is Your Name. Actually, you know what? Forget it. I want to sing back that other song. The death could not hold you. What a powerful name it is. Yeah, let's just sing that part. This verse I'm about to give to you is for you to summarize. It's a summarization of all this whole message here. Let's read it together in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 10 is the whole story of Good Friday. And Paul, when he wrote this, he was writing to the Romans. And to be very specific, the title of this is Christ in Our Place. If you're there, then I'll read it. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Take note here, there's this sentence here you need to understand. 
For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, once called sinners, not worthy, we are now a friend of God. We are now begotten through Christ as children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. No longer we are looking at each other as enemies of God, but we are in unity with the Father through Jesus the Son. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus did not just come just to die and just that's it and remain in the ground where, he, where, where, where normal human beings are there. But on the third day Christ rose. It is a proof that Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus is God. You can debate with any human being on this planet, where is Jesus now? Where do you think Jesus is right now? He's with the Father. But guess what, church? As I said, there's a part three coming up. Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back, it will be a glorious day where we will see the Son of God come down from heaven in glory and we will be swept up in paradise. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for that day to come. I'm prepared for that day. I'm preparing myself, and you should too. Nobody knows the day or the hour the Son of God will come, but it is for you to prepare. Get the people that you have in your life to be prepared. Because when Christ comes back, we will no longer be here facing a lot of difficulties, facing a lot of pain and suffering, but we will be in eternity with God, basking in the great joy and happiness that God is waiting for us to come back home. God is waiting for us to come back home. As a matter of fact, the prodigal son is a testament of God's love. How deep the Father's love for us. God sent His Son into a world not to condemn, but the world will know the Father through His Son, Jesus. Shall we all rise and let's just sing the song together. Let's come to a time and lift up our voice unto Jesus. This evening is all about Jesus. It's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about anything else. It's all about Jesus. All about His marvelous death on the cross. The cross that saved us. The cross that brings hope. And the cross that certifies us as we are no longer enemies of God. But we are begotten and loved and we are a friend of God.
Friday, you took all of our sins to the cross. Not just the ones in the past, but you even took the ones in the future sins onto the cross. And we are no longer bound by the curse. Yes. We are free. Amen. And we thank you, Jesus. Yes. And on the third day, you did not remain dead. Yes. You are alive. Yes. We thank you, Jesus, that Good Friday is a day where we do not only remember only the crucifixion, but we remember that we are no longer enemies, but we are a friend. We are begotten and we are children of God. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you also, Father, of our Father, for sending your one and only Son. For you love the world so much that you sent your only Son to be sin, that He can come into the world and He can, he can take all of our sins onto the cross. We thank you. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done, oh Father. We thank you, Jesus. We cannot thank you enough. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Your name, which is above every other name, everything that has happened in the Old Testament was preparing the way for the Lord, was preparing the way for this day, for Good Friday, for Jesus to die. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word speaks to us. We thank you that we now have this book in our hands that we can read and we can learn and we can study more of your word and we can learn more of you Jesus oh Father God we give this evening all dedication all glory to Jesus that Jesus you deserve all glory you deserve all honor and this is a dedication service to you Jesus we commit each and every one of us here tonight this evening Lord we commit all of these people here Lord Father God Father God, we pray, Lord Father God, and we thank you, Lord Father God, for this evening of this service, Lord Father God, that Jesus has paved the way for salvation. He's paved the way for your healing, and He's paved the way for your freedom, for dying on the cross. If you need to know more about this love, of this great freedom, you can learn more through the Word, the Word that sets you free. Let this evening, church, be an evening where all blessing, all glory, and honor is given down to Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we thank you once again for this evening. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May He make His face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lord, lift your countenance towards us and give us peace. May we have an evening, Lord Father God. We'll go back, sleep peacefully this evening, Lord Father God. May we, God, remember our Lord Jesus Christ for all He's done. We cannot repay you, Lord Jesus, but we can serve you give our lives to you. And we thank you for coming into our lives, for coming into our hearts. And Lord, we receive you. For those of you who need to be reconfirmed back again, you know, you can stay back after the service. We, we can pray for you. The leaders are here. Elder Darren Park, Elder William is here. And we can come together and just pray. You know, there's nothing wrong with staying back after the service. You're not taking anyone's time here. This evening is given unto Jesus. So make this time and this day count. Thank you, Jesus. We commit each and every one of us here to end. We thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. We give you praise and glory unto your name. Bless us as we depart with your blessings. Bless us as we depart with all of what you have done for us, Jesus. Thank you so much. We give you thanks and praise. In all glory to your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.